So first off, a little basic botany. Um, we know here in temperate North America that every year a tree deposits an increment of growth or a tree ring around its circumference. And as we go from year to year, we can see rings are added one after the other. The first ring in the center and the most recently formed to the outside. So we have the oldest in the middle, the youngest outside right next to the bark. And this goes on and on as long as the tree's alive. Now if we take a look at some actual tree rings from this oak tree, we can see a nice pattern of light, dark, light, dark. And each one of these little repeating patterns is actually a tree ring. And you can see as we move out to the outside, we get to the bark. So let's take a close look and sort of zoom in on some of these individual tree rings. And here we can see a very interesting pattern. Again, this light, dark, light, dark. And this is from a white oak tree. And as you can see in the beginning of, say, 1773, we have these big early white vessels here. This is called the early wood. And as we move to the later part of the tree ring, we see a lot darker wood. This is called the late wood. So this early wood, late wood repeating allows us to identify individual tree rings. Now the science that deals with studying these individual tree rings is called dendrochronology. Dendro tree, chronos time, and logos to study of. So dendrochronology sort of helps us look at what past conditions were like, how trees were actually growing throughout time. And there's many different subfields of dendrochronology. People have used tree rings to answer all sorts of questions, such as when were flood events, when were forest fires, uh, when were earthquakes. Now the subfield we're going to be interested in today is something called dendroarchaeology, where we're trying to figure out when an individual piece of wood, a timber in a barn, was cut down. When was it modified by humans and incorporated into a structure? Now, if we take a closer look at these tree rings, we can actually see some variability. 1772, eh, normal. 1773, about normal. 1774, though, it's a much tinier ring. And 1775, a very large ring. So this annual variability is very interesting. And in fact, it's what makes tree ring sciences possible, because we're actually able to look at variation from year to year. So why do we get this variation? Mostly due to moisture availability. So for instance, in a very droughty year, we would expect a very small tree ring, not a lot of water, very hot temperatures. In a more moderate year, we would expect to have a larger ring. So it all is based on resource availability. And the interesting thing is, that's based on climate. And this is great because it provides a common or homogeneous signal throughout an entire forested area. So for instance, if I know I have a drought or a small ring in 1774 in a tree in one area, I can expect it over a large area. So what we get is a repeating pattern that's quite similar from location to location. So some of the goals of this long-term study, um, they're several fold. First, we want to date the construction of historic buildings. We want to figure out using tree rings and interpreting their growth patterns when were these actual structures built? Secondly, we want to create what's called a chronology. And this is just a series of accurately dated tree rings that reach as far back as we can possibly go. Now, what we'll do ultimately with this chronology, hopefully, is sort of tap some of the information that is in these tree rings. For instance, we, we looked earlier at the 1774 ring. It was very tiny. Well, we don't really have climate records available that far back. So what was happening in 1774? Well, maybe we could perhaps recreate climatic events, looking back in time how trees grew by comparing to what we see in our trees now. In other words, we can help to figure out what's happening. So how do we actually obtain these samples? Well, several different ways. Uh, here you can see me um, in a house that, well, folks live in, so we have to be very careful how we take these samples. And what we use is a power drill, and you can see me holding a power drill there. And we also use a long circular tool. It's called an archaeological bore. And all it is is a tube of steel with teeth at the end. So what we're able to do is sort of drill this into a beam, extract a small cylinder of wood, and we can actually look at the tree ring patterns we see on that piece of wood.